Okay. So uh, I'm just going to talk about laparoscopic uh, partial nephrectomy. So why a laparoscopic approach? And there are several studies that have shown with the laparoscopic renal surgery, there's less pain, there's quicker convalescence, and there's optimal cosmesis. And when we first started doing these, we did these uh, little exophytic type of, of tumors. And then it evolved to doing more central tumors uh, to patients with VHL with multiple tumors and patients with rather large tumors. And so essentially any patient that comes in at least to our institution um, is approached laparoscopically. If we need to convert to open, we will convert to open intraoperatively, but the approach is, is laparoscopically, and I can say, watch, I have to open up a case next week, but it's a rare occasion that when we go in to do a partial nephrectomy that we have to convert to open. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is just it's, it's, it's technical. What, what we do, what I do is technical. I've just been fortunate enough to get a lot of cases. Um, referred to me, which is why I got good at it. Um, but uh, I, there are people who are, are better at it than I am. We'll get to that, that part of the discussion. So in terms of approaching it laparoscopically, I think we need to talk about cancer control. And this is actually from Long Island. This was a truck. There was a big mosquito a problem in Long Island. There was a truck sp spraying DDT, and a sign there says, a DDT, powerful insecticide, harmless to humans. Um, and if I was a young child, I'd be running through the mist, and I have vague memories of being a, a small child in Brooklyn, and these trucks would go by and, and running through the mist. Um, but we know that uh, um, for killing the mosquitoes, we caused a lot more problems. And similarly, when you're doing a laparoscopic approach, you don't want to kill the mosquito. Okay, Mrs. Jones gets out of the hospital a couple of days earlier, but is then left with a problem three or five years down the road when they have a recurrence of their tumor. So we have to be very careful when applying any new technology to treat a malignancy. And in terms of cancer control, we actually had the longest follow-up. We have 10-year follow-up now of only 48 patients. Uh, and of these patients, they were relatively small, all less than four centimeters. We had two positive surgical margins. And we had recurrence in two patients, but none of these were the patients with the positive surgical margins, these two patients. And one was in a different location in the kidney, and one was a pulmonary metastasis. Um, two died of unrelated diseases. In terms of positive margin, just to digress, and it'll be interesting to, to see the, the other speakers' thoughts on this, this is a paper I did with Indy a few years back that our pathologist gave us positive margins. And part of the problem when you're removing these things laparoscopically, you put them in a small sack, you're pulling them out a hole, and sometimes you'll get a, a crack in the capsule or whatnot. Uh, and early on, the first two patients came at positive margins. I said, oh, my God, I went back in, did a radical nephrectomies on them, and there was no tumor in the specimen. Uh, and the remaining patients, we ended up, uh, one patient we ended up crying, and then we followed seven others. Uh, one died of VHL with metastatic pancreatic tumor, but the other six did not have recurrence. And I think this has been ours and other people's experiences that a positive margin may not meet a positive margin. It's really not a great way. Doing intraoperative biopsies, um, I talked about this Michael earlier, um, that it is, uh, is not going to tell you whether or not it's, 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 it's sufficient or not. And I think, at least in my experience, visual inspection no matter how subjective it is, still what we utilize the most of. In terms of outcomes for more complex, this is uh, uh, out of Halifax, a study of 71 versus 51 open central hyomasses. The complication rates were the same as with peripheral tumors and no difference in their positive margin rates compared to their open patients. So you can do complex patients uh, with minimal complications. In terms of risks of complications, there have been several articles looking at this, and when you first start, you have a high complication rate. Um, and, uh, but the majority are low complications. With experience, it decreases. You have more complications, obviously, with larger tumors that go deeper in older patients with higher comorbidities and with longer ischemia and with decreased preoperative renal function. In terms of our complications in our first 825 patients, we had 11% complication rate, delayed bleed in 3% of patients, 
and urine leak in 3% of, of patients, and we found it made no difference whether we put a stent in or didn't put a stent in, and we actually never closed the collecting system. I haven't closed the collecting system in years, and our leak rate hasn't gone up, and they all heal on their own, and I think the danger is we've seen some cases referred in in which when in, in partials they've gone ahead and, and sewed things up and un inadvertently closed the infundibulum or whatnot. So, um, um, we know from bladder cancer work and from, we know actually from Arthur Smith at our place that you can make huge holes in the kidney and within 48 hours um, the, transitional carcin the transitional epithelium is re-epithelialized over and I think that's what we're seeing um, going on in the kidney. In terms of uh, comparison with laparoscopic and open, um, this is a paper that Indy published in response to an earlier paper that we published along with Andy Novick and Mike Blute looking at complication rates comparing open and laparoscopic. And Indy was upset and I was upset about that study because it compared our initial laparoscopic experience with the open experience after each had done over a thousand open cases. So there was a big differential. So um, when Indy got to, the magic number looks to be around 700 cases of partial and looking at warm ischemia again, it was compared to a contemporary comparison when he was at the Cleveland Clinic, the warm ischemia was less, complication rate was not significantly different, to GU complications not significantly different, but there was a lower overall transfusion rate. So it seems to be equivalent. Um, we have just, and this is coming out in BJ, it's, it's online currently of our off-clamp partial nephrectomies uh, that I mentioned earlier, and again, I think that, again, it is all technical and with experience. There's nothing magical about it. It's just that as you get better at doing things technically, you can do bigger and bigger tumors, and you can do more advanced tumors off clamp. And we can talk about that maybe during the discussion. Um, this is a paper from uh, Jeff Kadedu's group comparing laparoscopic to open. At least in the United States, it's actually $400 less per case if you do it laparoscopically, and I'm not saying robotically, I'm saying laparoscopically versus open. But what you end up with is with this, and this bothers me in terms of the medical waste. As Dr. Jew showed the very nice slide there, uh, the only thing that looked disposable on that tray was your knife, uh, whereas when you do these laparoscopic procedures, there are a lot of fingers in the medical pie, and they make money by making disposable, um, disposable things. And we have to think about this. Maybe right now it's a minimal thing, but down the road, uh, as we worry about our planet and we have to go green also in the operating room and think about using more reusable equipments. And, and they exist also for the laparoscopic approaches. Um, to make things even more difficulty with partials, people have been doing a trans, uh, uh, notes uh, partial nephrectomies. This is from one of my partners, Lee Ridgestone, who is a far better laparoscopic surgeon than I am. And uh, so he has, a, uh, he has a handful of patients that he's done uh, um, laparoscopic partials uh, via a single incision, which is possible. And I think uh, most patients, the only other than cosmesis, I don't know of any studies that show there's any other advantage, most of our older patients couldn't care less about it and would rather get off the table a little bit quicker. Um, but there are some younger individuals with tumors that this is an appealing approach to. Now the problem is with the laparoscopic partial, it is hard work. If it was very easy, it was like giving somebody a tablet of, of a sulfa when they have a urinary tract infection, we'd all be doing it. But it is difficult work. It's, it, it's a hard thing to do. So we've been trying to find ways to simplify it. One way is hand assist and putting a hand in there and hand assisting, having some tactile fee, feeling, giving a level of confidence if you get in the bleeding to hold pressure, et cetera. The Da Vinci, you know, it's good for everything. Um, and so this is what is pushed to Da Vinci in our country, is that uh, it, it, uh, it allows more doctors to be able to do the surgery, um, which is the bottom line. It doesn't offer anything to a given patient other than you don't have to uh, travel someplace where somebody could do it laparoscopically. But um, so we have to ask ourselves, is the expense of this um, worth it uh, to, to society to be able to do this? In terms of if you look, compare robotic and laparoscopically, again, looking at this, there's really no difference be between them, uh, between the two. And the warmer long, long ischemia is that they weren't very good laparoscopists, which made the cases take a little bit longer, but there was no difference in terms of outcomes between them. 
the problem in surgery, uh, there are a couple of problems in surgery. Um, besides it being hard work, we've always adopted a see one, do one, teach one type of uh, um, philosophy. We really don't have great training mechanisms. And this is, uh, there are plenty of these out there, and these are bad, ha bad haircuts. And this is a haircut of my son. And my son had come home from college, his first year of college, this is a few years back, and was going to visit his buddy across the street, Tim. But before he did that, he was going to go get a haircut, so of course he wanted $10 from me for the haircut. I gave him $10 to go get a haircut. So he comes back with this, and thank God his mother wasn't home. And he said, well, I stopped by to see Tim, and Tim got this new haircut device for his dog, and he said, can I use it on you? And he, he said, yeah, and he said, doesn't this look good? And he's like going like this to the thing in the middle of his head. Uh, and he, and uh, he said, and plus I got the $10, so he's holding on to $10 like it's his. Um, <laughs> It wasn't his after he went back to the real barber. But, but whenever you do anything for the first time, whenever we're starting something for the first time, we're going to have a lot of bad haircuts. We're going to have bad outcomes, unfortunately. And there, for the grace of God, our first laparoscopic nephrectomy didn't end in a disaster. Looking backwards and talking about it, Ralph, that could have been the end of it. And God was looking down when we did it. It wasn't anything magical we were doing. And we had several bad haircuts after that that we can, we can tell you about. We had several bad donors after doing the first donor. Fortunately, we got it worked out and went forward. So, so how do we solve that problem? And I think the solution to the problem is out there. And I know Dr. Clark is here in the audience. Are you a Manchester fan? Isn't everybody, right? <laughs> I just say, hey, oh, hey, oh. In any event, <laughs> even I know it from New York. So what do the professional sports teams do? All right, do they go out and get a kid from, you know, any kid says, I want to play soccer for Manchester United and play soccer. No, they go out and get somebody like this. Right? This is Rooney, correct? I got the right picture, right? And again, so he's well known all over the world in terms of this. They got him because he's technically good. And he didn't all of a sudden in his last year of college say, boy, I'd like to play professional soccer. He demonstrated technical ability to play soccer, to do something technical. Let's go back to this. We don't want to admit as surgeons. We were barbers. We were dentists at one time. We, were, we are technicians. And the problem is we're not doing what the sports teams are doing. We're not looking at aptitude. It's very antithetical to medical practice, surgical practice, that we won't allow somebody to do what they want to do. The reality is, I think, going forward in the future, we're going to have to have the Roonies of surgeons to be able to move these things forward. It'll make better outcomes for patients. It'll be less expensive for society. It's going to happen. The problem is how do we get there? How do we get people at a younger age? Simulation. And it's very funny, when we were interviewing residents in Baltimore, Bal Carter did a very um, informal study when we interviewed people. He, he always liked the musicians. Now, you didn't know, he didn't listen to them and see if they were good musicians. Everyone on their application plays, I played the piano, I played the guitar. You don't really know if they're very good at it. Uh, but uh, his feeling was if they had good technical skills, um, that perhaps they'd be good surgeons. Some programs have started having the resident applicants tie knots when they come and do technical activities. And what they found is that just scared everybody off. So they stopped getting some of the good candidates because they were afraid they were going to be tested and, and judged on this. This has to be boiled back down into our medical schools in terms of selecting out people who will be good for surgery. Um, and simulators have to be developed to do that. Um, there have to be ways of judging it. This is a study that we did at our place that was just published this past year. Um, um, in surgical endoscopy, looking at eye tracking. And you could actually, this, has been, this is done for looking at air, uh, air Force pilots to see when they're ready to go on missions and whatnot. And you can track involuntary, or voluntary and involuntary eye movements. And you can actually, actually um, see differences in experts and novices. And you end up getting a gaze tracing. While they're looking around, you get gaze tracing. And this is from a, a, a laparoscopic. On the left is an expert, it may be me. This is one of our interns. And you can see how tightly the eye movements are during the laparoscopic reflection of the colon on the far side of the screen, whereas on the near side of the screen, novices are looking around. Their eyes come off the screen when they're looking on the floor for pedals, etc. And you can actually do, there are mathematical formulas. There, there are algorithms in which you can look at the, um, you can actually uh, um, look at it as a percent of expert time. And so we actually looked at some of our chief residents, and the top bar, the very top, is me over time. I'm one of the experts over time. 
And you can see I'm not always an expert either. When you're looking through a case, there are times I drop off perfection. But it's interesting to see that over time, the residents at different PGY year years would improve in terms of their technical ability. Very interesting, the green bar, one of these residents, he was god-awful. He was just terrible. And so we got him and we actually made him, he wanted to get better. He went on a simulator and by his second year he was able to catch up to the other residents. So practice does make perfect. We just need better simulators if we're going to keep up the current sim system we have now. There's also objective things in terms of PET scanning. This is coming out in uh, archives of surgery this year. Uh, we did several people in terms of PET scanning in a scanner. We did people do laparoscopic procedures in a trainer in a PET scanner. And comparing the, the novice to the expert, novices, medical students, interns use a lot more of their cerebellum uh, activity in terms of doing these new tasks, whereas the motor cortex is used in experts. So there may be ways of, of objectively seeing when people are ready to go on to, to operate on individuals. I think we need to get to that point. So in conclusion, coming back round to what I'm meant to talk about, middle invasive nephron sharing surgery is feasible and the results seem to parallel open surgery. Is this the future standard? No, I think the future standard are image guided ablations and observation, knowing who we really don't need to operate on. Thank you very much.